Hi, thank thank you for the invitation, and I'm go, I, I'm going to talk now. Uh, going to cover both the, the topic of what I'm doing in this uh, short-term fellowship, most uh, looking at the learning in citizen science, but also I'll kind of in the second part I'll I'll bring in some some questions about some specific topic that that interests me for a long time about the. Uh, social characteristics of this crowdsourcing project and what the implication of participation inequality is on um, on learning. So I'll start with a bit of present, uh, introduction to some typologies and goals in citizen science because that kind of give the different types of activities that exist and um, and give a background to kind of discuss different types of learning. Then we can look at uh, different aspects of learning from projects that are more belong to contributory, which is the generally the kind of top down, the one that scientists set and people join, and collegial project where people come and create the project. So different groups, communities, people from all walks of life are creating it. And finally, as I said, I'll get into this issue of participation in equality and I'll explain also what it is and you'll see. So one of the early typologies of citizen science came in 2011 from Andrea Wiggins who was doing that as part of her PhD was kind of looking at different systems and was trying to make sense of what she was seeing in this area and she kind of took a lot of project and created some uh, analysis and tried to organize it and she kind of came up with, with those goals and, and aspects of physical environment or digital environment. So she talks about action-oriented projects, which are projects that our uh, participants are actually dealing with their specific concern. A lot of time those can be uh, different issues and local agendas like environmental issues or concern about pollution. And then people are getting involved conservation projects, which are all the projects that exist within ecology, and there are loads of them. Um, and uh, that will be also led by scientists a lot of time. Investigation projects, which are actually aimed at pushing specific scientific agendas, and a lot of time belong to starting from labs or starting from scientific areas. Virtual projects, which are based mostly online activities, and educational projects where the primary objective is um, to educate participants and get them um, learn about the topic. Now this thing is actually mixing both the uh, technology, the goal of the project and other aspects and actually later on you, you can get from Andrea different aspects. One of the most a widely accepted classification of citizen science is one that emerged originally from a report uh, in 2009 by Rick Bruni and others, and that one is actually a chain that it's cutting the bottom, but on its slide there is the source of it. That was uh, from a paper by Jennifer Shirk and others that are talking about five types of classification which actually mostly relate to the role of scientists and the role of the participants. So they said that in some projects you can have a contractual project where the community come with this issue but then they bring in scientists and tell them can you please look at the issue for me and report it back. Then there is contributory projects where scientists come up with an issue and they need a lot of people to help them they then go out to the uh, wider population and ask, can you please help me in the project? They design the form, they design the activities. Usually it's the scientists who will do also the analysis and the public. Mostly in that area, it was mostly about environmental contribute data, but we also know about projects where the public contribute uh, basic analysis. There are collaborative projects where after the first uh, starting, although it started from the scientists, there is much more scope for the participant to start asking questions, to raise issue, to uh, adjust the research questions. So actually you will see in a minute how that can be viewed. A co-created project where from the start they are being created together with the scientists and collegial where actually it's not clear where the scientists are. There are more consultants than a uh, 
than driving the project. So the issue and the whole process is being created outside academic circles. And one way to present it is with this type of activity. Again, it's coming from originally from a paper about environmental management. But what is interesting for our discussion, I'll, I'll explain the things at the bottom. So you got there two figures, one figure of a scientist, project owner, assuming, and the general public. And you can look at the different stages of the scientific process, question, study, design, data collection, analysis, understanding the result. And then because it's environmental management, they also talk about management action, but we can look at, at publication of an academic paper as the same thing. Uh, you can also uh, think about what the geographic scope of the project, which is valuable in an environmental project, uh, nature of the action, so who is taking the action in this case, what is the project as a whole, and that's uh, what we mentioned earlier, and you've seen it in the Wiggins thing, is it the research priority, so is it mostly about discovering new aspects that will go to scientific publication, or is it more about education priority of educating and increasing the knowledge of participants? And in traditional science, you see that the research priority is the highest, and the education priority is usually low. They are putting it out as papers, and uh, the interaction is mostly within the scientific community itself. The contractual, as you can see there, is actually the participant, the public is involved at the beginning at the end. There is a medium research priority because a lot of time the question that the participant will bring is very localized. And the education priority is also exists there because there is the interaction between the scientists and the public, but it's not hugely high. The contributory project are the one with high education priority and high uh, scientific priority. And as you can see, the errors and the interaction are getting much more messy once you move from that point and you move into, say, the collaborative, where you can see that uh, once you get into the data collection and getting into understanding the results, actually people do contribute to the different aspects and that might raise new questions. So that's very common in ecological project where uh, the people who collected information on the ground might have noticed different things that the scientists then thought in the original study design and that can uh, evolve in different ways. And the co-created require more participation, but you can see that the scientist is still quite central, whereas in the collegial, the role reverse. Yeah? So that's yeah, one way of... Mm -hmm. There isn't one, and in, I, I know nope. you, can, you can do many, many permutations of, yeah. of this, and it, it's not, it does make sense to do everything and to name everything, but it's interesting that there isn't a category where it's really equal yeah. partners. The co-created is the closest yes. one, but it's, but it's still, you see that the error at the beginning is starting from the scientist. A lot of time, yes. So in yes, many, that, that in, yeah, the... yeah. In many cases, that that will happen, um, and that's that's an area where there is lots of potential. It's a lot of it is because access to tools and access to resources. So if you need, for example, let's take an example of of projects that are now becoming common in water. Once you get into analyzing what you collected from the sample, you need a lab, and for that. It, you end up with a scientist. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's how yeah. this thing can. I know one example where a family association of kids with a specific uh, genetic mm -hmm. mutation realized that the, the toes uh, in their kids were fused in a very particular way. And through Facebook, they collected the data and they collected yeah. the. What, yeah, that would be probably yeah. the contractual. That, that will be all either contractual or a lot of time those web diseases are lots of time falling into the collegial of people collecting information and then going to scientists and saying what's going on. So yes. What's the reason why for collegial and co-created the geographic scope needs to be narrowed? Uh, just so because it's, it's in environmental management a lot of time they will come from local issues and that's naturally so it's not the place. In the it's not inherent in, in the approach. And, and that's why I'm emphasizing that this analysis is actually, and I'm coming from geography and environment. So. I just wanted to ask about the education priority. Yeah. I feel in a lot of cases, 
it, the learning that happens is sort of happens by accident nearly. Exactly, and we'll get to that in a few minutes. You you will see that, and this is the one that I'm I'm responsible for. Um, I'm very pleased that it's popular, but basically I've tried also to, to think about the relationship between participants and project owners. And the bottom one is crowdsourcing, when the, the, you are asked very little, a lot of time. Uh, the, the, there is debate about the levels of cognitive engagement, but generally speaking, you might be asked to, to put in a sensor and keep it working. Or you might be asked to uh, put the software and keep it running on your computer or things like that. The next level is distributed intelligence where like a lot of crowdsourcing projects you are being asked to analyze information. You not completely have control over the analysis and although more and more projects and Zooniverse is a good example of it, it allow interaction and for people to ask questions but they don't change the classification scheme. Whereas in other projects it does happen. Participatory projects are kind of going in a minute, you'll see about how those different classifications relate to each other. And finally, the extreme citizen science, where just like the collegial, it's actually people are involved in all the stages. So here a comparison between those five methods of them. And there is something interesting that uh, kind of myself and Andrea Wiggins done better than the most common classification. And the issue is that when you look at the universe of all citizen science projects, the contributory group is the biggest one. And therefore, it is kind of presenting them all as equivalent is actually a false dichotomy. And you see it across papers, you see it in conferences, see it across the board. And I'm kind of breaking it in two levels, and Rea is kind of giving it a bit more classification, and that's something to remember that that area is the kind of bulge in, in the whole framework. And it's not a surprise, actually, it's also important both in my analysis, in Andrea, and in the other analysis. A lot of people just want to join projects. They don't want to come up with the issue. And there are several conditions where people would want to join or create a project. But a lot of people will be interested in helping science by science telling them what they want them to do. And that's valuable. So in any case, the typologies that I've just shown you are analyzing environment, technology, engagement, relationship with pro uh, professional scientists. But what they are doing is that learning and creativity are not explicit. They are kind of mentioned there, but not explicit. And something to uh, remember within this kind of context of learning is that actually all citizen science projects are a balancing act. And that's one of the fundamental problems that, that once you start analyzing what's going on in the field, you discover that, that something is, is some, something got to give. And the reason for that is that when you look at it, like for example, we mentioned the project that are aiming for highest academic uh, scientific output. They want to get a paper that is at quality for science or nature. Or in a geographical project, they want to be able to cover the whole country with observation. So they want to have full uh, geographical coverage. They also, there are projects say that, that want to increase people's awareness to a scientific issue while they are doing that. They want also to achieve inclusiveness, so people from all walks of life are involved. Increasing scientific literacy, accessing resources that people have, uh, creating an enjoyable and engaging experience. You can't have it all the time in all these areas, and it's actually a lot of time something that people have to balance between them. But what is interesting within this set of goals, and those are kind of collected from different papers, is that actually uh, about half of them are linked to learning. So you see there the increasing scientific literacy, uh, the enjoyable and engaging experience, awareness to scientific issues, um, and uh, the inclusiveness is also involved. So the general questions that are kind of coming a lot of time in uh, citizen science is that who is learning and what are they learning? And that's a very common one. 
And the next one is, is the learning actually been designed into the project? So people are, and you'll see in a minute, where we can say that things are designed into a project, but which aspects are not designed, and that's something that it's really interesting in the work, for say, of the learning planet work that is happening here. Uh, which goals are addressed and through the learning process and tools, and is the learning evaluated and does it actually inform the project in a feedback loop. So that's a model that Laura Klotzer and people from uh, the University of Geneva Education kind of created in a project called Citizen Cyber Lab, which ran actually with the CRE 2012 to 2014, 16, something like that. And, and that's really interesting in their analysis. They analyzed, they, the nice thing about the project is that we had the range of activities. So we had the contributory project, we had volunteer computing, we had the games, so uh, Hero Coli the, that you see below, it actually came out of this project, so we had games, we had people participating in Extreme Citizen Science project, which we contributed, and we could look across the board about what people learned. And that was really interesting. There was task mechanics that people are actually learning, and that's something that you don't even uh, take into account in the training of how you actually operate a specific instrument or a specific software environment. And I'll show you later that some of them are quite complex. There is pattern recognition, which is the common one that people notice in things. There is on-topic learning, which is the things that you learn about the science that is done on the, on the project that you participate in. So in volunteer computing, uh, we looked at IBM World Community Grid, where they provide you seminars, or even just by looking at this, the screensaver that run in the background, people are starting to have questions about it. There is understanding of the scientific process, so that's our scientific literacy. Off-topic knowledge and skill, which are interesting, I'll show you them in the next thing, and personal development. In later stages, they actually provided a, a wider taxonomy of issues, and here what we can see about the generic uh, knowledge and skill. So for example, they discovered that some people, it's not surprising, but some people learn how to operate socially with other volunteers and become coordinators. And in different projects, we have uh, people who are emerging from volunteering into coordinators and into uh, involving other people in their activity and actually becoming quite pivotal in the way that the project operates or there is uh, different aspects of technical ability where they involve in web design and other issues and they learn it through that. But then there is also the uh, personal gain and personal development of, of uh, learning through the uh, process of involving and working on a project and feeling confident, for example, that you can do things in science and so on. Another place where you can look, and I would recommend if you are interested in this area, it's really worth looking at this report. This is coming from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and uh, Math in the States. And it's called Learning Through Citizen Science, Enhancing Opportunities by Design. It came in 2018. And they are kind of pointing out that those things can happen in different citizen science projects. Increasing interest in science, using scientific tools and practices, learning project disciplinary, content so you can see the equivalent to the uh, previous analysis, developing understanding of explanatory scientific concepts, scientific reasoning, and developing identity in science. And that is an issue that if you haven't came across the uh, concept of uh, science capital before, it's a, con it's a concept that is now emerging as a valuable one. So the same way that there is discussion, and it started in the 80s, about social capital. So the fact that some people have more connection in society and are capable to utilize it in a different way. Uh, Louise Archer, who is now having a lab in the Institute of Education, uh, have developed the concept of uh, uh, science capital. And what she mean by that is that if your parents are interested in science, and therefore didn't switch off the television when a science program came along. And they took you to the science museum. 
and they bought you the book about, uh, I've seen child book about quantum physics and other things, and kind of encourage you to do that. There is no surprise that later on you find it more accessible, whereas other kids cannot have it and didn't have this experience. So you, you can actually start talking about these concepts of science capital and how, <coughs> how it influences, and that's where the identity in science is evolving. So let's, with this background, so you can see that there are some framework now for learning. There is, I, I left creativity aside, but there are some emerging in different places, and they're both looking at formal and informal education. But we can look at specific projects and how, how they are working. So for example, in the UK, there is once a year, at the end of January, uh, the Big Garden Bird Watch. It's mostly designed as an educational activity to reach out to new people that are not usually familiar with uh, birds. The way it works is that you look out of the window for one hour, you got an app. If you look carefully, you can see that there is an, a counter at the top. Uh, it picks up the birds that uh, are in your garden, or not in your garden, in your area, according to previous years. And therefore, there is a better chance that you will be able to identify them. Um, and they use this information to kind of general uh, overview of trends in birds, but they don't, uh, it's not assumed to be as reliable as other data sets about observation. But it gives you an amazing picture of the UK because there are 500,000 people, between 450 to 500,000 people that participate in this activity. And that's very clearly an educationally oriented activity. Similar to that, there is the activity of BioBlitz. When uh, people come to a specific area, and uh, a lot of time it's a family activity, bringing in the kids and going over an area and learning about all the ecology and all the species that exist in the area. Some people point that this is actually a semi-contributory activity because if there are uh, observations that are being done about the area where people are studying, there are experts or very experienced amateur naturalists in place in order to identify. So it's not assumed that the people who come to the event are actually familiar with it. And that's bring it very much into the uh, educational range. And we can say uh, some people within citizen science argue that this is not real citizen science because it's the, the scientific output of it is secondary to the educational goal. Not my view, but it's important to know that there is a, a school of thought within that. The, another one that is interesting is one that is happening in the US and been running for now over 20 years. It's called COCORAS, Community Collaborative Rain, Hell and Snow Network. Uh, where uh, it started from flash floods, that actually the problem with, with weather predictions is that you need a very fine network of observations in order to realize that there is a major event. And your general models will not give you enough information. So um, um, and weather experts from uh, Colorado created this system. And there are many volunteers. You can just see the, the network of all the volunteers in different parts. Um, and what they do is that they, have, they get this very uh, simple uh, gauge. And, and what is happening here is actually quite interesting. They are being asked to <coughs> submit observation every day at the same time. So they go out, they check, they tell how much precipitation there was, and then report it. But actually the purpose of it, apart from the fact that it helps modeling, it's not about that. It's to get the volunteer used to report and to observe. And that has become critically important when there is an extreme weather event. So it's actually you maintain the system and you maintain the awareness of volunteers because the mechanics of it are very specific and you want to get their information when things happen. And they are there to, in order to report it. So it's not that their information on a daily basis is being discarded. It's been reported, it's been used, they're getting thank you and all the rest of it. But actually the network was created for the extreme events. And that's an interesting example 
of how the learning is there in order to do that. And they have, for example, special instruction of how to measure hail. So they take a bit of, um, of styrofoam, they put in a bit of uh, foil on top, they let the uh, hail fall and then they can report on it. So they get all these protocols, but that's because they are used to the mechanics. Another example is this one. Um, even on, you know, volunteer computing, again, another place where some people are arguing, hey, people are not doing much. Where is the cognitive effort in downloading software and letting it run on your computer? So within the climateprediction.net, which is a project where people are helping scientists with running the uh, non-conventional models. So, so the problem is that the resources of the supercomputer that are being used for climate modeling are being used for a very specific models, the, the standard models. But then you want to check for sensitivity analysis and you want to check different scenarios. So a group in, in Oxford reached out and created climateprediction.net uh, and there are uh, 60,000 people and more that are involved in supporting them and allowing them to run different models. But this is the, the sc screensaver and people regularly ask questions back to the scientists from what they are seeing within the model and what it represents and what they have learned about it. And then there is usual reporting also that is coming in from the project team to the volunteers. So even within, that's an example of on-topic learning where people express an interest and they want to feel that they are doing something about climate change but then they are starting to learn more and more about climate modeling and then ask questions about how the model run. Similar learning existed in Galaxy Zoo and you could hear uh, frequently Chris Lintot and Kevin Shawinsky admitting that basically they had too many images and they wanted someone to help and they just hope that, that there will be enough people who will help them. They didn't start it from a point of engaging people and getting them in to learn more about astronomy. They just discovered that there are lots of people interested in that. But what they discovered when they set up the, uh, the project and, and had all this massive amount of images and share it, is that they, they had people like Hani, Hani von Erkel from the Netherlands, who basically started to look at different images until he came across the image that you see there. And she started asking, what's that? And people say, oh yeah, it's not standard galaxy, just, you know, it's not important. And uh, she continued to insist on this issue, and actually she discovered a new type of galaxy. And it's called now Honey Vuelp, or Honey Thing, I think, if I'm understanding it correctly. Okay? Um, and that's, that's a case of someone moving from just an interest. There is another bit, if you want to read the kind of another uh, bit of the story is that Honey got involved in that thing because she liked Queen. So what happened is that she liked the, the band Queen and she was following um, Brian May, or more accurately, Dr. Brian May, who when he finished his playing in Queen, he went back to Imperial College to finish his PhD in astrophysics. And then you know, on his blog, when Galaxy Zoo came along, he published it. And that's how he got involved into that. And then finally also discovered a new type of galaxy. So what you can see here is a trajectory of someone learning things in a system that originally was not set into that. And that's the interaction between the scientist and the participant. So if we look at kind of generalize this thing, is that in those cases you have data collection processes and protocol, we have detail about the issues, so learning about what birds like. Um, for example, there is another thing about the Big Garden Bird Watch. It's actually set for the last week in January because this is the period where birds have the least food and because parents don't want to disappoint their kids, it is usually recommended to put food outside for the birds, which this way the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds get people to feed birds in the winter. 
but they don't do it in a sneaky way. They actually say that it's part of the process, and you learn about those things. Organizational skills, familiarity with systems and procedure, and new patterns and discoveries. So let's look now at the more the other end of the spectrum, the kind of area where you have things like DIY sensing, where people are building up their own sensors, or the kind of DIY science, civic science, the area that the public laboratory of open technology and science operates, where you have makers who create new scientific instruments. A lot of time this is within the context of environmental justice issues where communities are concerned about pollution even next to them. There is an issue that caused them to actually start the scientific process and uh, then you, they, they get engaged and they are creating things like, for example, a balloon mapping kit that allow communities to attach a camera to a balloon and take picture of different pollutions, they picture spills and other things. So within those projects, you, you, you can uh, see cases of people developing new social learning. I'll show you a bit more of it from, from our work. Uh, problem solving skills, issue specific, because people are really uh, interested in the specific um, action. But also you get the, especially here, more than the other project, organizational skills and communication and political action. But it's not always perfect. So one uh, aspect that um, Cindy Regalado, who've done um, a PhD with me, and she was involved in both Citizen Cyber Lab and in um, doing it together, science project that, that work with the CRE. Um, she was pointing that when you look at the individual learning within a DIY community, you can see both positive and negative things, which are really important. So she was pointing, for example, that, that in uh, engagement, there is all kind of internal and external interaction and issues that people need to do. But uh, there is also cases where people feel marginalized within a group and therefore start to uh, spill out. Or there is a self-criticism where people feel we, if we remember those science capital concept and the fact that people feel sometimes that science is not for them. Uh, she's done a lot of work about uh, engaging people in, in the playful aspect or uh, f the failure, the fail and learn and the need to persist and all the rest of it are things that can be learning, but sometimes for some people it can lead to disconnection. So. I'm now going into our project to show uh, one or two examples of that. So this is what we do. This is what we define as extreme citizen science. So extreme citizen science for us in the group is something that is situated. So it's in a place a lot of time. Uh, it's, it's got a connection of place. It's a bottom up practice. So we are trying to ensure that the community that we work we are not coming and telling them what to research, but they will come up with it. We're taking into account local needs, practices, and culture, which is especially important when we're working with indigenous groups, um, and work with a broad network of people. And that's also coming because we don't assume that the communities can do things of them by themselves. So especially with marginalized groups, politically and power relationship will tell you that they them, telling them here's the information you can go and fight the political system is just unrealistic. So you'll need to kind of put together the networks and the people that will work with them. And then we're trying to build new devices and knowledge creation processes that can transform the world, which is where we're coming into action research. So this is our definition, I'll show you some few examples, and it's not always from remote places, but it does influence the way we are thinking about learning uh, an aspect. So we worked in one um, social housing place in London where they were concerned with a scrapyard. So a place where in the center, you can actually see it about here, where they uh, broke cars and crushed metal, and there was a lot of smell and noise. We first done a study with them about the noise, 
and the community demonstrated that there is an issue with the noise that then the environmental authorities took into account and changed the license of this uh, scrapyard. But then they continue and say, there is something with the air. We, we can smell things, but we're really concerned about the air. We were lucky, and at the time, the uh, Imperial College ran a, a large project that called Open Air Laboratory. And part of it, they had a lot of these things, which are called diffusion tubes, that were about to expire. So a diffusion tube is a technique from the 1970s. It, if you see the top, the gray top, it's actually including it a mesh with a chemical that is reagent to NO2. So, and what you do is you put it out, you leave it for about two weeks or a month, depending on the period, and you get the average amount of NO2 in the air. And this is such an accepted technique that it's now been accepted by uh, authorities and it's actually the standard in which things are being measured. So we could actually use both the ability to access those diffusion tubes, but also the fact that people from the community actually drew on this map. This is the original map that I scanned, showing where they wanted to position them. And that's if you look at the map that we compiled for them, providing them the information that actually there was a lot of issue. And what was going on is that there were lots of uh, trucks that were coming into the scrapyard, which were <coughs> idling. So just standing with their engine operating and that created a lot of pollution. And just above these uh, red dots that you see on the maps, um, there is a school and there is a kindergarten. So we could make the case that those things need to change and the local authority need to operate. So here's something interesting because this area of air quality, if you'll go online, you'll find a lot of sensors, a lot of people offering local sensors and I can, you know, you can buy in different periods and in that period when we were doing that, people were offering different tools, so the Smart Citizen Kit, uh, the Air Quality Egg and other things. And we were putting in this type of, of analysis and there are some important aspects to it from our perspective. First of all, the, the techniques that were coming in, the local sensors, were not always comparable to the official information. And that created an issue for the community in terms of the action research. Maybe for the researcher it was interesting because they wanted to have a lot of data and see if they can compare it or improve it towards the official information. But from the community perspective, they wanted something that they can go with the local authority. Second thing was the installation and communication. We tend to take for granted that sensors require battery and link to the Wi-Fi and all kinds of other things, especially if you are a creator and actually you made it and it's sitting already on your shelf, you forgot all the stages where it disconnected from your network or that you had a problem with your Wi-Fi software, all these kind of other things. These things just require a step ladder. That's it. We can give it to anyone in, in different ages. It was easy to use. It's, it's also allow us to do, use local knowledge in an easier way, although the local sensors are now getting better and you can put them on different places. Again, the, the constraint the technology bring in to measurement is something that we don't always think about. So if you don't have access to a Wi-Fi point in a specific place, you can't put your sensor. So actually the distribution of accessible Wi-Fi points is does influencing your distribution of local sensors. Thing like that, so that's why we claim that it's inclusive. The, there are issues. It's it's not. It's giving us only one measurement. It's uh, it requires uh, more engagement of people and so on. But it, but we have cases where we display the information. You can see there a workshop where people are kind of setting up the information and sharing it. So what what we can say about those things is that we have diff interesting learning. So we. It took us time to, to learn the most uh, relevant tool because in the early workshop in the PIPs, we actually also done things like two leaves to check the magnetic response of the leaf because the leaves, you know, when they started, which is around uh, March, April, 
and you can measure when the first appear. You can use something called phenology for people recording when the leaves are appearing. Then they absorb the metal from the car and therefore you can take them off and send them to the lab and analyze it. But that proved to be expensive and complex and you need really good lab in order to check it. So we also checked something called wipe sampling, which is you take a window, you clean it, you leave it for two weeks, you then wipe the sample from it with a special tissue that dissolves, that gives you some information on heavy metal. So that was another technique and we have used low-cost sensor. So of all these things, we, we try different things and the diffusion tubes prove that in this area of what we're trying to do, which is to be active politically, to be inclusive to different groups, to allow things to happen in a wide scale, and to allow it to be replicated, <coughs> that proved to be really uh, good. And the best example in, in yes, in Flanders, there was 20,000 diffusion tubes that were distributed and, and were carried out in a study a few years later. Mm -hmm. a graph, but here with the diffusion tubes, you actually see it accumulating then, right? The pollution of the graph. Yes, although... Like people can see and believe yeah. it with their own eyes instead of weird measurement techniques that that matters a lot? Or? It does matter, and there is some research that coming in from interaction designers and uh, some really interesting things that Mohab Balastrani in Ideas for Change has carried out and demonstrating that you can create actually the sensors as a more visible aspect and it's actually valuable to make them visible. What is also interesting in this case is that there is a quirk with the diffusion tubes. They've been installed at 2.5 meter, which is not the level that you want to measure breathing, which is 1.5. And that's because historically they are installed there because the engineers that designed it originally wanted it to be not vandalized. So if you'll go around and, and look around you, I'm kind of, I think, probably look like very nerdish as I go around the world and take pictures of, uh, of uh, monitoring stations. I'll actually spot them in different cities. And, and one of my things about it is that monitoring stations and things like uh, municipal monitoring is a lot of time designed with engineering thinking and not always with the science. It's not the best science. It's actually science mixed with engineering and constraint in different places. Yeah. When you say they're, they're low cost, what's the cost per, per tube? Per tube, there are now six to eight pa uh, euros. Okay, per tube. That's, yeah, per tube, including the analysis. So you actually send them, and, and the, that's, that's where the, it's become science with the politics of environmental management, because you use the same lab that the, local, that the authorities are using. So that kind of helps you because you say, I'm using the same place as you are using. If, if my data is bad, your data is bad, and it's actually closing the issue about data quality, which is a lot of time coming. So did you go into the community and say, what are the issues, how can we help, or did they come forward and say, we have this issue, we're looking for scientists to collaborate with us? With that community, it actually was exactly what you've said. When we came and said, What's the issue? And they say it's the scrapyard. And they said two things, noise and air quality. So we said, okay, let's deal with the noise. Which one is more important? Say noise. We went for the noise and then went to do. Now here's the second case that I'm going to show you is actually, again, interesting case about how technologies are being changed. So this one is coming from a project called Everywhere that was, we. We actually had a, a project together with the University of Rome, people in physics, and they gave us this app called White Noise that are saying we, should, we sh can use it to, to measure level of noise because they knew that with the PIPS estate originally, we actually went and bought uh, noise meters. And in this case, the noise meters were about 60 euros or something like that, so we could buy only 10 of them. But they said, hey, people, by, by 2012, when we started this project, uh, we said people have mobile phone, they can have wide noise, and they can just use it. 
only one problem. When we took white noise into the uh, acoustic chamber, it was off by 20 dB. That's, that's serious. Okay, that's, so what we can say about it is that it's low, medium, high. We can't say that the numbers that you see there, it's telling us something. Okay? Do you know how much uh, off is it? You can, can say it, no? Hmm? If you know how, how, how much... Yeah, but you need to know... Uh, you can yes, you can. But the problem is that you have too many phones. So, so oh, that's again where you need to take the that where you need to take the issue. Actually, what we discover by looking at into this issue is that, of course, the quality of the microphone is something that phone manufacturers are keeping really secret. They don't give you the detail. You might find, you know, you you might find the component that they are using, but then they don't tell you exactly which DSP they are using. They surely won't tell you which software they're using internally because between, say, Sony and Nokia and Google, etc., each of them want to offer you a good quality. And actually, it's been designed for human voice. And it's doing all sorts of things, like we discovered that iPhones are cutting at 100 dB, all sorts of, of things happening in different places. Um, and, and therefore, and you can't get hold of the raw data. So we checked if the, if the operating system will tell you, here's the data, use it with it, whatever. Because it's so important, they actually don't, don't give it. So with this information, we're actually going to the community, in this case, community around Heathrow, because we, from, from our perspective, in this case, it was different because we were giving this up by the project partner. And basically, it was the case of, I have a participation problem, can you sort it out for me? So we were thinking, okay, which communities will be interested? We reach out to different communities. The community in, around Heathrow, who are concerned with the third runway, with the development of a new runway, were interested. And here you see the workshop that we carried out in the community. But we went to them and we said, this, this is not like, if you want, Noise meters, we still got them from the PIPS estate. We can buy more, we will give you, and you can write down and all the rest of it, collect the information, or you can use the app. And they said, we want to use the app. The reason they want to use the app is that A, they get on the BBC, on the evening news, on the TV. And secondly, what they are doing is that actually really interesting. They are hacking what the science is going to tell them. So what they've been doing is that there was a notes area and they were doing two things. Each person that collects information, it's demonstrating that they are annoyed. And because the level is high, you can't tell me that there wasn't a plane because it was high. You said that it's low, medium, high. So if it's high, it's high. You know, that's, that's something that even good enough science can tell you that this tool is measuring. And then I can record how much I'm annoyed by this flight. And we had 500 people reporting about their nuisance they are getting from the different flights, and that allowed them to create, together with Christian Old, one of the researchers in, in my group, um, a designed map that they could then submit to the airport commission and other things. Now this was, again, interesting. It's, there is a whole analysis of this issue within Christian chapter, but what is interesting in this case is that from the area of, of learning, we have sharing limitation of the potential application. So we are completely honest about what technology and what science can do or not do. Then there is representations that express the community views. So this representation that you've seen was created together with them and Christian kind of interacting with them about what they want to express and developing a new initiative. So we actually started with a contributory project, but it's actually ended up as a collegial, which is an interesting case. It's not usually happened. The final example that I'll give is from a project that we've done in Seattle, where we uh, were working with engineers that are specializing in uh, earthquakes. And they were, uh, we, we went to different community and asked them about preparedness. And that eventually led to the creation of 
a tool of data collection tool that is now integrated into uh, uh, as we um, ArcGIS Online. So part of their training, they are now using our lessons from how community can collect data. So there are different types of communities that we discovered there, communities of practice, interest and place. Uh, we have different tools that, that adopt to different life stages and priority. So for example, we discover work with, um, with parents, with uh, mothers and toddlers. So one of the groups that, that we mapped there was that, was of mother and toddlers. And they looked at the uh, Red Cross <coughs> application and they said that something is, is not good with it in terms of the checklist, because it included some issues about, about what uh, parents need to prepare in case of emergency, and people in Seattle do have a pack in case of an earthquake. Um, and what they've said is that they, when you have a very young baby, you actually need to make sure that you updated the nappies every two months, because otherwise you'll have the wrong size and you'll find yourself in a situation where you need it and it's not available. And other things like that, or the food, or, or other things. So they ask us to develop for them an app that, that is actually having an expiry date and update, help them to update information more frequently. So you can kind of discover those aspects of uh, general training and resources. So the final thing that I'll do in the last five minutes, and it's a really short one, but it's kind of throwing more questions at issues, is, okay, we've seen this education, we've seen this involvement, now let's look at, at the weird things about citizen science and the problem area of citizen science. So here's a general classification of, of Europe in terms of levels of education, and you can see that about 27% of the population in Europe got tertiary education, what you would call higher education. And it's different in different countries. It's from 15% to almost 40% of the population. But a lot in, in Western Europe, it, it will be approaching 40%. And generally, we see a growing number of people with higher education. And about 1% of these 200 million students around the world are actually PhD students. Still 2.5 million PhD students around the world right now. but still 1% of the total population. Now let's look at different projects. And we, I've looked at OpenStreetMap in 2010 with uh, Nama Buddha Tuki, and we kind of ask people about the demographics of them. And you can see that actually most people, as in 95%, are actually coming from this cluster of 27% of the population. Not just that, 8% have PhD in the people that are involved. And that's a project where people are creating their own map of the world. The mechanics are complex, <laughs> the uh, process is complex, you need to be really committed to get involved with it in the first place. But generally speaking, it's really striking that, that it's high level of uh, people with higher education. Not only that, Galaxy Zoo the project that is a lot of time presented as something with low barrier to entry. Again, when it was looked at in 2013, you can see that here, they actually, uh, while you know, the, the third that are below that, high school or unknown, is actually there is still over-representation of people with higher education and over-over-representation of people with PhDs. The, a worse example of that is probably this one, Transcribe Bentham, which is a project about uh, transcribing the writing of Jeremy Bentham, a philosopher from the 19th century, horrible writing. And he wrote a lot, something like 100 <coughs> pages a day. And there is a project at UCL, because he was one of the founders of UCL, to record him. And the environment, as you can see, if it reminds you of Wikipedia, anyone here tried to edit Wikipedia, it's painful, okay? That's an, a, a transcription environment that is quite as painful as Wikipedia. 
So the mechanics of it, the things that we see earlier, the mechanics of it, you, you learn a lot about on topic. You learn about all kinds of weird things about Jeremy Bentham, but you need to be interested in Jeremy Bentham in the first place. And I don't know how many of you even know about it, although utilitarianism is quite influential all your life. But that's, <laughs> we leave that. So if you look at that, 25% have PhD. Now, those kind of demographics bring us the first question about learning and education. What, who are we teaching? Are we teaching the people that learn more about the topic, which is great. In one way that, that I'm claiming is that this thing, citizen science is extracting value from societal investment in higher education. But what are they learning? The second one, that point that it's worth pointing, is participation in equality. So almost all these large-scale projects have a phenomena called participation in equality or the 99-1 rule. So if you look, it, it's, it was discovered in 1992 when people analyzed a mailing list, but actually you know it as the Pareto principle, as the 80-20 rule, as, you know, it existed quite a lot before that. And what you discover is that when you look at any large scale project, you actually, the general rule of thumb is that there are 1% heavy contributor, 9% occasional contributors, and 90 that are just lurkers. They don't respond to. Check the mailing list of the CRI, check the mailing list of research, start to analyze how many people are responding. You will discover something like this pattern, uh, even in small group or in large group. Now in a uh, blog, it's getting worse and Wikipedia really, really getting uh, very badly skewed. And it's very common that the bigger the system, the percentage of people that are involved is very small. And um, I find this phenomena very interesting because the question is that, is it structural or is it actually something that can be controlled? So here's the example from OpenStreetMap, the project that I mentioned to you. Uh, there were, at the time in 2014, there were something like uh, 2 million registered users. By the time you'll finish the first 50,000 or even the 25,000, you collected most of the data. All the rest of them contributed very little in terms of their data. And what you see here is the amount of nodes that they were contributing. Or oh, another one is iSpot, which is a project where people take pictures of nature and report on them. And again, you look at that, that's the uh, number of observers, and that's the number of people who done IDs. Again, although they had 200,000 participants, by the time you go into the first uh, 100 or 200, you basically done most of the work. The, the skewness is appearing, and that appearing also in identification. And what was interesting is that in one of our one PhD student of mine, uh, Valentine Seymour, also found it in project of volunteering, of environmental volunteering. So she looked at all the detail of volunteers that just come in and look at different environment and then improve it. And then uh, she demonstrated that there are, again, a very small group of people who are contributing a lot of data. So the question here between those two, first of all, what is the interaction between the demographics and this participation in equality? And also, if we are taking this participation in equality into account in different citizen science projects, how are we going to think about learning in a way that actually take into account that most people will do just one session and we want to achieve something with that, you know, very uh, minimal interaction? and that we'll have the middle group, and then we'll have the extreme group, and are we going to create different activities with that? So that's kind of two questions to throw in and finish it. Thank you.